75 million people or something like that belong to this, this group worldwide, but it started in Japan. And it's a group that focuses on natural agriculture. So they will um, put in uh, a group of seeds and uh, see which plants grow best. And then they will harvest those seeds, take the soil from that point, um, and then store that over the winter in the springtime. And then those plants go back into the same bed. They do not rotate. And so one of the things that they're proving to people is that rotation is not necessary. So, you know, this whole idea in the world of organic agriculture needs to be adjusted. We need to change some of the organic regs. Because I really think there are probably two um, systems that you could use in the organic world. You could go having to rotate because you're tilling and you're destroying the biology and you're constantly keeping things at a very early succession state. Or you could stop tilling and start to put compost and mulch and the understory plants and maintain the same plants in the same place without having to rotate. And you develop that biology that supports the growth of the plant you want to be putting back into that bed year after year after year. So the Shoemake Garden at Rodale has been there for uh, about six years, on its seventh year. Um, and so a really good demonstration plot of hmm, a different way to do organic. So look forward to the fact that we at Rodale are going to be trying to push the organic world in yet another horizon. Uh, it's not simple to change U.S. government regs once they've been set. <laughs> Bureaucrats. Oh, we can't do that. No, well, how about if we try this? No, we can't. Yes, we can. So, interesting conversations like that going on. At Rodeo, we do have um, this trial that's been going on since 1981. So, here we are in our first year of comparing two conventional um, growing systems. And so what we're doing is we have a conventional system that has all the tillage, all the chemicals, you know, just as destructive as you possibly can, um, growing corn, wheat, and soybean rotations. We then have a conventional system that is minimum till. Everybody out there calls it no-till. No. It's minimum till. So we're putting in green cover crops, or a lot of people call them green manures, in the uh, fall, so the green manure comes up. Uh, it may get beat back by a severe winter. If we have a severe winter, we are starting to not have winter. Uh, we just have some cold temperatures, but like this last year, we had no snow. The year before, we had 12 feet. The year before that, we had about 3 feet. So, highly variable winters in that part of the world anymore. So, if the um, green cover crop doesn't get killed by the frost or by the cold winter temperatures, then you till that in in the springtime, and then you plant whatever rotational plant you're putting into the system. So the two conventional systems. Um, quite often in the green cover crop, if it's still growing in the springtime, they will use herbicides to burn it down and then till that in. So the conventional systems. Then we have organic systems. In this uh, whole trial, and you can see all the different strips. Um, each strip here is uh, about an acre worth of uh, plant material. So acre trial area. We're adding nitrogen because typically in organic systems, nitrogen is a limiting factor. So how are you going to add your nitrogen? You add it as manure or we put in legume cover crops through the growing season. So in the manure systems, we have tilled manure systems. So we put the manure down in the fall and till it in. And then plant our crop in the springtime. So manure system. <coughs> then manure <coughs> minimum till <coughs> there is a green cover crop that's put into the system. And uh, so a rye cover crop is typically grown and then it's mowed in. 
um, in the springtime. And the legume systems, again, till the systems. So the legume is thrown through the winter time and then tilled in comes springtime. And then the no-till or minimum till is the rolling and crimping. Um, you roll and then crimp your cover crop. And this is uh, the crimping system developed by Jeff Moyer at um, Rodale. And so the idea is here you have a permanent understory crop that's in your system. In the springtime, you roll the um, rye vetch mix. So it's a rye vetch mix. <clears throat> and it doesn't kill the rye at all, it just whacks it down enough. So that now you strip till into your uh, bed of rye crimped uh, vetch. So the vetch is providing the nitrogen. And, uh, and then you plant your crop right in there. It pops up through that uh, permanent cover crop. And we're seeing a lot of really good results uh, with that, this system because you don't have weeds. So you don't have to be in there trying to deal with weeds. Or we hand weed these plots. This is 72 acres. That is hand weeded. <laughs> so you see where we need your help. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of fun and exciting, yes. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the spacing is from row to row, but it's typical for the corn, so most of the corn in all these systems is gotta be about two feet between rows. So there's a fair amount of grass that remains, or the rye vetch mix that remains untouched. And so you're maintaining that biology in your soil. You strip till leaves every two feet, your rows of strip till, but then you have um, the plants that are maintaining underground. And what we find is that the corn in those uh, rolled and crimp systems uh, maintain mycorrhizal colonization, they get mycorrhizal very fast. And that's a really important part of getting your nutrition back into your corn. Corn has to be mycorrhizal. If you're ever going to stop growing it without pesticides and organic fertilizers, it has to be mycorrhizal. So, how do you that? It's just deep enough to um, put the seeds in, so they're going down four to six inches. And so it's a chisel plow typically that they're using, and they've got a really short chisel. Uh, most chisel plows go down 12 inches. But we've got a short chisel, so it's only going in about six inches. We want to disturb the soil to the least extent possible. But the, the, name of the strip is uh, about, be about um, ten inches. That actually gets tilled in the The name of the toe that developed this roll room method? This is uh, Jeff Moyers on work, and he is the farm manager at Rodale. Very common name in Moyer, it's a very common name in that part of Pennsylvania. So if you want to get hold of Jeff, it's jeff.moyer at rodaleinstitute.org. Isn't that tricky? So rodaleinstitute.org. And my email address, just in case you haven't figured it out, is elaine.ingham at rodaleinstitute.org. So any of us. Put our name, first, last name, and you'll get hold of us at Rodale. So this has been going on for 31 years. Last year we put out our 30 year report. And what we showed was that hands down, the organic system was the way to make money. Across all of the organic treatments compared to both of the conventional treatments, an organic farmer would be walking off with about $44,000 in profit at the end of a year. Compare that with conventional growers, they would only walk off with $20,000 of profit. So all that data, all that information is summarized in our um, um, booklet. And if you go to our website, you can get <laughs> annoying. Uh, if you go to our website, you can get that booklet. So this is called the Farming Systems Trial. And it's been going on since 90, 1981. 30 years of data. I really don't think anybody can be arguing 
And nobody could be saying at this time that you're going to lose money if you go over again. We did not have a period of time where we lost money as we converted to organic. If you pay attention to the biology of your soil, you are not going to have reduced yields in the first year that you go organic. That's great. Does that take into consideration the labor and yes, it takes into consideration instead yep. of like taking volunteer labor? Yeah, because here we document the number of hours, and so in our calculations of how much this would cost. We put a um, you know, salary on the hand labor that goes into these systems. But the cost of the pesticides is going up and up. The cost of genetically engineered um, plant material because in the conventional system, when you're growing corn or soybean, you would use GMO corn and you would use GMO soybean. So yeah, this part of the road deal is sequestered. It's off in the way of the northeast corner. Uh, our northwest corner of our property, and the uh, wind blows that way, away from the rest of Rodale and our other organic crops. It doesn't have GMO in the system. We'd love to get some money to look at how rapidly that genetically engineered pollen and plant material and root systems decompose when we put it into a biological plot. So we'd like to work on that, but haven't found a funding source for that yet. Question. Pardon? That profit per acre? The 44000 I believe you have to go look at the report. No one's ever asked me that question before. But I'm pretty, because it's got to be on the same amount of land right. here versus there. So I am not sure. Got me on land. So <laughs> get the report and take a look. I think it's per acre, but I'm not going to no, yeah. uh, Okay. For, I don't know what you have to plan. Okay, so we have that that's been ongoing and still going on. What I want to do with this research uh, is to go back over the last 31 years and look at the seed that's been saved from all of these trials and look at the nutrient density in the corn seed that was produced 80, you know, back in 1981, 82, 83, and compare the conventional um, material with the organic material and demonstrate that we have much, much higher nutrition in the organically produced um, corn, wheat, and soybean. So again, looking for money to do that one. And then next year, put in vegetable crops. Same management schemes, but let's grow some food as opposed to growing stuff that typically eats animals and they eat the animal. So putting in vegetable trials into these systems and getting some very different food sources and looking at the nutritional quality as we look over those different kinds of systems. Question? Are there uh, labs, uh, commercial labs that do nutritional density? Work? Yes, there are. So you can um, recommend one? I, we're in search of one that we really like. There's um, one in California that does an extensive number of trials. So Chuck Benbrook who has just moved to Washington State University from the Center for Ecological Studies in Washington. He's the one who has the connection to that lab. Chuck Benbrook last uh, November put out a report on uh, the Nutritional Quality Index. So what nutritional assays do we have to be doing on all of these different kinds of plants? If you go back in time and you look at some of the stuff that the USDA has done, they have looked at total nitrogen in plant material, or they've looked at total phosphorus, or they've looked at total sulfur in plant material, and said there is no difference between organic and conventional. But that's not the important thing. Because in conventional plant material, most of your nitrogen is present as nitrate. If you are consuming a plant that has most of the nitrogen in the form of nitrate, What's that going to do to you? Causes cancer. We don't eat nitrate. What's the form of nitrogen that us as human beings should be eating? Protein. We eat protein. We don't eat nitrate. We don't eat ammonia. So if you do total N, sure, there may be no difference in the total amount of nitrogen in conventional versus organic grown materials. But what we really want to know is protein, we want to know enzymes, we want to know vitamins, we want to know hormones. Huge difference. 
when you look at conventional versus organic. Now, it's probably about a year ago that the USDA released a study where they went to a grocery store and they took conventional food and organic food off the shelf and compared the two. And again, what they showed was that there was no difference in nutritional um, um, quality between the organic and the um, conventionally grown material. But I've talked to the technicians they sent to the grocery store to pick up that material. And it turns out that the organic material that they were testing had been on the shelf for about five days. The conventionally grown material had been on the shelf for about 30 or 40 minutes. And the organic was no different from the conventional. We know that shelf life reduces the benefit, the nutrients inside any food. You pick it and it starts to lose nutritional quality. So if after five days your organic was the same as, no better than the conventional that had been just picked, just arrived at the grocery store, what does that say about the truth of this? If the USDA was honest about uh, paying attention to what they were actually doing, they should have gotten organic material that just been picked, conventional material that just picked, and compared those two things. So now in our trial here, because we're growing the, all of the produce in exactly the same soil, in exactly the same temperatures, the only difference is the um, agricultural the farming system that we're using, um, it should be a more honest approach. Now, the only thing that we really have left to do is uh, figure out precisely which assays, what is, are the important nutritional assays to do on corn. It's not going to be the same for soybean and it's not going to be the same for uh, wheat. And certainly the seed material left from 1981, yeah, but both the conventional and the organic was stored for exactly the same amount of time under exactly the same conditions. So it's still a valid comparison. So these are some of the other things that we're doing at Rodeo Question. <coughs> This isn't too far off track, but while we're talking about comparing organic versus um, chemical grown food, do you know of any literature that gives an, uh, an accessible discussion of the cancer causing mechanisms in chemical fertilizers and pesticides? You know, that the lay person could understand and follow? That would be something I would definitely ask of Chuck Benbrook. Um, he's made it his kind of his career to try to understand and where's the documentation and where's the science there. So why uh, he's at Rodeo? No, Chuck is at the uh, University of Washington. If you just Google Chuck or Charles Benberg, B E N B R O O K, you would probably be able to come up with where he's actually at because up until. I think it was June of this year, he was at the um, Center for um, Organic Studies or whatever that, I'm not, I'm not getting that name quite right, but he quit that job and he took a job at the University of Washington. Which department he's in, I don't know. <coughs> Although, thank you. Yeah, they certainly gained a great, a personal uh, and excessive amount of knowledge about it. Yeah, it's hard to talk to Chuck, Chuck because TMI, TMI. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep it simple. <laughs> but then I can wipe them out when it comes to biology. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have a lab service where we look at the amount of carbon that's been sequestered in soil, and clearly in organic systems, we are sequestering a lot of carbon. Really want to work on that interaction when it comes to compost. When we're composting correctly, and we're using that compost to go back into the soil. How rapidly can we increase the organic matter, the sequestered carbon in our soil? Some of the calculations that we have done suggest that if we actually composted and took all of that compost material, all of our food waste, and composted it and used that then on our land, we could, in the course of six months, 
take all of the elevated CO2 in the atmosphere and put it back in the soil and hence it came. We could solve global climate change in six months if we compost it and we did it correctly. So, could we have some funding for that? <laughs> so demonstrate that to, to folks. Um, so often you hear the line that it um, takes a, a hundred years to build an inch of soil. My response to that is, that's absolutely ridiculous. I can build an inch of soil, I can build a foot of soil in about 10 minutes. Give me compost. And you mix that into your soil. And now we've got all that organic matter sequestered. Our uh, plants grow much better. We've got the life that we require. How fast can you build soil? Overnight. As long as you have the compost. Well, so see, do you count the time it takes to make the compost? Okay, 21 days. So we will go through some of these composting systems, uh, maybe starting tomorrow afternoon, but certainly all day Thursday we'll be talking about them. You had a question? It's kind of this, uh, when you say food scraps, I'm, I'm also thinking of all the stuff that comes through us. <laughs> if we can change all that human food in the compost, oh my god. Yeah. You're, you're going to do it in six months with that. Yeah, human manure, animal manure, not a problem if you understand how to compost correctly. It's just keeping it aerobic. It's when people, you know, go throw a block in the corner and, and then call that stuff. Um, compost, is, uh, that's where compost gets a bad name. And when you think about the composting industry, how has it come about? It's really because landfills were filling up too fast. And somebody said, well, you know, we should take all the putrescible material, put it in a pile, and let it blow off all that carbon dioxide so the pile shrinks. And if you compost incorrectly, you can shrink your um, organic material in there from, uh, you know, starting with 100%, you can shrink it down to about 20%. Well, where is most of that organic matter gone? Not only have we lost the carbon, this carbon dioxide, we've lost our nitrogen, it's ammonia, nitrous oxide, all those wonderful greenhouse gases. Uh, we've lost our phosphorus is phosphine, we've lost our sulfur as hydrogen sulfide, and we've made some really nasty black particles from the smell, so think of all those wonderful smells that are not. Methane. So we have to do it right in order to achieve our goal here. And it's easy, it's quick if you just understand. Any others? So you can just read some of the stuff that we're doing. I don't know, I don't know. You can read. You can go back and have some fun with that slide. So um, going into some examples. And really the reason I'm giving you this set of examples is to now give you practice in how you approach a problem. You may not work with golf courses, you may not work with the specific examples here, but I don't care what kind of system you've got, you're going to approach it with the same mindset. What are the questions? Then, under the specific problem <coughs> you experience in each of these systems, how did we solve the problem? And it's really the same approach, the same thought processes, you're going to use on your property or on your neighbor's property or on a commercial client that you're going to start working with. Why be concerned with soil life? Well, I think we've really gone over that already. Uh, healthy life makes healthy, healthy plants. And so when you get the proper nutrition in the proper balance and a flat, then the plant tastes good. How many of you have ever picked up a lettuce and taken a bite out of the lettuce and gone, oh, so bitter. It's just, uh, would never eat that stuff. But you know, it's lettuce, it's good for me, so. <clears throat> and really, you know, when it tastes that bad, you ought to throw it away. You ought to spit it out because when you get that real bitter flavor, what do you eat? Nitrate. That is the flavor and the taste of nitrate. So don't, it's, it's got to be good for you. No, if it tastes bad, it is bad. Spit it out, exit, leave it. Don't touch it, especially as a microbiologist. If your sushi tastes bad, that's because you've got the wrong bacteria growing in there. See, sushi should not taste fishy. That fishy flavor, 
Those are those bad bacteria growing on the fish. You mean that that fishy flavor and that fishy odor will not cross my lips because I know exactly what those bacteria are and what they're going to do to my digestive system. This is the problem of being a microbiologist. It's like McDonald's. Would you ever go and eat that? No. It's not meat, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's pink slime. And they mean it when they say slime. So that's not how I want to get my protein. Thank you. Question. So my last bowl is it goes from tasting good to having this bitter taste. Is, what is that? It is that change in the composition of the nitrogen in the plant material itself. So you're getting accumulation of some nitrates because that plant is now going to push all of that to seed production. And so through that process, all that good protein is getting moved out of the leaves. What's getting left behind is mostly the nitrates that the plant has sequestered. Plants will often, especially in, in chemical systems, they're getting too much nitrogen, but they don't have enough potassium. They don't have enough phosphorus. And so they have to luxury consume the nitrogen and they sequester that away in their leaf material as nitrate. So exactly which process is going on in this particular sample? Uh, the only way you can answer that would be to look at the nutrient concentration in that plant material. High nitrate, or are you just looking at some of the other products that are produced when all of that protein goes into the seed? Just to clarify, nitrated byproducts with too much fertilizer? Or can it also be done by just too much manure? Or yeah, you can. Anytime your nutrient cycling is unbalanced, what do I mean by unbalanced? Well, you're gonna have to wait till later this afternoon. Okay. So I mean, understand how that gets unbalanced, even in a natural system. Can we be messing up? Can Mother Nature mess up? Well, oh, sure, she can mess up. It's called disturbance, hurricanes. There is a big disturbance. How about an earthquake? How about a landslide? How about so we can have these things happening in the natural world as well. We probably just want to be able to recognize when it's happening and then how to avoid those conditions. What do we do to ameliorate those conditions so we don't have really bad tasting plant material? So flavor depends on the balance of those nutrients. Where do plants get their nutrients? Um, yeah. How many nutrients come from above ground? Two things. So what are the two nutrients that come from above ground? Actually, your plant gets nitrogen through the root system. It has to come through the soil. Your plant is incapable of taking up the form of nitrogen that's in the atmosphere. Can't touch it. This is inert. Something else has to happen to that N2 gas before your plant can take it up. It comes through the soil, so sorry, that's not a nutrient you get from above ground. Water? No, sorry, water comes through the root system. This has to move into the ground. You have specific processes that will take up the water, so it is through the root system. Oh wait, my plant can take up some water through this domain. It's, yeah, it's about 0.1%. So water comes through the root system. So what comes through above ground? Carbon dioxide taken up by the leaves in the process of photosynthesis. Well, that's the, not the only nutrient that you get from above ground. The other nutrient, and some people will argue with you about whether it's actually a nutrient or not. Well, you can't manage without it. And it's called sunlight. Sunlight and CO2, what is your plant doing with that? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, and what are we producing in the process of photosynthesis? Oxygen. Mm -hmm. What was that? Oxygen. Oxygen. Sugar. Mm, yeah, okay, so <laughs> sugars. So what the plant is really doing is storing sunlight energy in the carbon carbon bond. So your plant's going to take one CO2. Blow off that oxygen, <laughs> waste product, for which we are very happy that they do this. Get rid of that oxygen, don't need that stuff. So now it's got one carbon, but now how is it going to bind that carbon in a useful stored energy form? It's going to take that sunlight energy 
and use that sunlight energy, there you go, that sunlight, to bind to the second carbon, or to the next carbon of the next carbon dioxide, to blow off the CO2. So we've got a carbon, carbon chain. So now our plant wants to have longer chain carbon, so it's just gonna store more sunlight energy and stick another carbon on there. So you can kind of think of carbon as the placeholder, storing energy. And this structure right here is what we would call a sugar. Just a simple straight chain sugar. That's what we make in photosynthesis. How many of you know what we mean when we say a C3 plant or a C4 plant? So C3, what is meant is that these plants, a basic unit to build everything else in the plant is a three carbon sugar. Everything is based on that unit. That's what the plant makes in photosynthesis of so storing energy in that form, C3. When we're looking at C4 plants, now that you know what the three is for, what would you suspect we're talking about here? The basic building block is a four carbon sugar. So what difference does it make? Big hairy deal. Yeah, but these are cool season plants because the way they build their enzymes, the way the physiology of that plant functions when it's building three carbon sugars is it does better in cool season. C4 plants do better in warm seasons. So how important is it that we start to understand that this is what's going on in your plant? Massive difference in the physiology because of this first step in forming the physiology of that plant. So, um, everything comes, everything else comes through the root system. So how important are the roots of your plant to your plant? Yeah. How many uh, essential nutrients are there that come through the root system? When I was a kid, there was only three. NPK. If you just had NPK, you could grow any plant. Well, you know, it didn't take long to be like, well, you don't know, really you gotta have sulfur too. And uh, yeah, while you're out there, you know, we may maybe need a little bit of cobalt. Then. Oh yeah, we need a little bit of boron, and your plant also requires both calcium and oh, it requires magnesium. So by the time I got to high school, it was uh, up from the three basic, you know, the NPK is the the necessary nutrients to, uh, I think it was about 12 basic nutrients that the plant had to have when I was uh, made it to high school. By the time I was in college, um, it was up to, I uh, think it was uh, 20 essential nutrients. So when I got out of graduate school, it was now 32. <laughs> Today, most plant physiologists, what's the number they put on that? 42. I love the fact that it's the answer to the universe. <laughs> Is that going to change? It probably has changed already, you know, because I don't keep up with people who play these kinds of games. How many essential elements do you have to have in order to stay alive? Almost no one, no one in the world of physiology would um, say that arsenic is an essential nutrient. But if you have no arsenic in your body, all you are is a little blob on the floor. Your nerves will not function. Is arsenic an essential nutrient? Absolutely. <coughs> not a little blob on the floor. How much arsenic do you have to have? Well, it doesn't take much. What if you get too much arsenic? Oops, nerves no longer function. <laughs> so it's a Goldilocks principle. You need enough, but not too much. How about water? Do you need enough water? Can you get too much water? Yeah, it's called drowning. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, everything, probably everything on the periodic table, we require some, maybe not very much. Do you have to have titanium in your body? Yeah, not much, but you are a member of this planet. So you have titanium in your body, not in a high concentration. So what are the nutrients that we require? Everything. 
Well, how do we get them? We are going to, the plants are going to get up through their root system. Exactly how do they take them up? So we've got to go through that oxy. Organisms do all the work in the soil. They either things that contain, and then a different set of microorganisms make those nutrients available to your plant. They build soil structure. They do the job of suppressing diseases and insect pests around the surface of your plant. Plants are feeding the bacteria and fungi through the exudates that they make. Dead plant material falling to the surface of the soil. And then we have to understand this whole system and how it works and all that permutation of all of these things. If we build structure, the roots are going to go as deep as they need to go. We will increase water holding capacity so you don't have to irrigate. In many instances, we've done this comparison, and I'll show you some examples, and I'm going to ponder. Um, we reduce water use by up to 70% as compared to conventional systems. Typically, in the first year of starting a program of getting the proper biology in the soil, we'll reduce water use by 50%, and in the next year, we'll increase that another 30%. So in comparison to the conventional system, if you've already started down the organic route, maybe we won't be able to do 70% water holding capacity, but we will increase its um, the nutrient, the organism's balance. Crop rotation is not necessary. I want to talk about that a little bit with the Shume approach. So we want to understand then with the understory plant species, the permaculture idea here of what's the companion plant, who's going to help your plant, what other plants might be neutral, what other plants might be supporting a biology that's detrimental to the plant that we want to grow. So we have to understand all of these things. And we will hopefully get there over the course of the next couple days. Here's one that people often have a problem with. What's a weed? What a Yeah. That's the herbicide company definition of a weed. It's what can I ask? Like, what was it? A plant out of place. Is it that? So back in the 1990s, the herbicide companies hired a, an ecologist. Didn't really have the credentials, but okay, we'll, we won't mind that. Um, sent them out to talk to everybody all over the United States to come up with what, of a def what the definition of a weed was. He presented his uh, findings at the Ecological Society of America meeting. And his take home message was that a plant, a weed, is a plant that's out of place. Because he just talked to the general public, and the general public's not real good at defining things. <laughs> so, if you take that as your source of science, uh, a weed, like an oak tree. I don't have this oak tree here, so it's out of place. It's a weed. Oak trees are weeds. How about if you uh, grow a crop of corn this year, and then next year you're going to put in soybean? Now you have all this volunteer corn that comes up. Does that make corn a weed? It's out of place. I don't want it there. No, that does not make a corn a weed. So what is the ecological definition of a, of a weed? What's the real definition? Weeds are plants that are very early in succession. They require disturbance. The soil food web has to get totally messed up. And we've got to be back in a place where we have just bacteria for the most part in the soil. Early successional plant species. When your system is disturbed, you are setting the stage to grow weeds. And they occupy that stage of succession. As you move along, as those weeds occupy the space, they're going to be changing the biology in the soil. Their residues that are put down are going to start changing that biology in the soil. And you see whole different sets of species of plants starting to grow. That's the next stage of succession. And those plants, then we don't usually call those weeds. We call them the brassicas, the mustards. Some of them are weeds. But they're changing and altering the biology in that soil. So that pretty soon you're going, you're going to be growing an early successional meadow system, a pasture system, grassland, whatever term you want to use there. Most of our row crop plants 
uh, a little bit later in succession. They require a little bit more change to the soil, but the change occurs because of the earlier set of plants. They alter the soil, they alter the biology, they put down different kinds of food resources, and so eventually we shift into a productive meadow system. They eat those plants now, different foods, different things going into the soil, supporting different balances of microorganisms, and so we will see the shift into perennial plants. Now we got herbs, now we got shrubs, now we got bushes, and they of course put way more food resources into the soil that support that fungal dominance, so now we see the shift to trees, and then to conifers, old growth forests. That is succession. So weeds occupy that first very de disturbance dependent stage of succession. Weeds grow very rapidly. For a short period of time, they're going to grow on the nitrates that are present. <coughs> what biology is doing in the soil, massive flush of nitrate is produced. Those plants suck up all those nutrients, produce a whole lot of biomass seeds, the seeds disperse. And then while the nitrate is low, those plants aren't really germinating it, and then the next pulse of nitrate happens, and now you get the next set of seeds germinating and growing. So we may keep things in a very early successional system for quite a while, depending on exactly what's going on, how much production we get in those systems. But that nitrate problem is really what supports the growth of our weedy species. Think about thistle. Any of you have a thistle problem? Thistle will not germinate and it will not grow until you hit about 50 parts per million nitrate. So if you can keep the nitrate level in your soil down below this, your thistle seeds will not germinate, they will not grow, you will not have a thistle problem. Nuts edge. Yeah, a little problem with this here. <laughs> this thing requires at least 12 parts per million nitrate. If you can keep your nitrate levels down below this, nitrate will not germ or nutsedge will not germinate, so it will not grow. <coughs> Once you have it growing, okay, that's a little bit different. You're gonna really have to whack it with a shift in the bacteria and fungi. But if we can keep our nitrate levels up. So every time you put out nitrate fertilizers, what do you set the stage to grow? Sweet. And they're more than happy to do that job for you, suck up all that excess nitrate. You know, so Mother Nature is basically saying, wow, look at all this excess nitrate here, who am I going to get to grow? That's it! Just to pick on a common row crop plant. What does corn require in order to germinate and grow? Up there? <coughs> yeah, there are about one part per million. It doesn't need that much nitrate in the system. Uh, it also needs corn, needs both nitrate and ammonium. And so it's going to need about one part per million ammonium as well as nitrate to get that one, to get that guy off the ground. So maybe we need to have a better understanding of what are the nutrient requirements by different plants. And then how does biology and the soil maintain both nitrate and ammonium? How does nitrate get made in the natural system? How does ammonium, what is this ammonium and nitrate business? So when we think about plants, what are the different forms of nitrogen? The plants take up. So most of our plants, all of our plants, the best of our knowledge, only take up through simple diffusion, inorganic, soluble, and there's the critically important part, soluble nitrogen. And those different forms are, of course, nitrate, another form of soluble nitrogen, and of two nitrite. So let me write these out because this is a little bit sneaky. Nitrate. Nitrite. The interesting part about nitrite is this will kill your plant. It doesn't matter what kind of plant you're talking about, but this is deadly. We don't want to see any nitrite levels. We want it all nitrate or 
ammonia, NH4. Many soil chemistry re reports will get this one wrong, and I always have to giggle when I get a soil chemistry report and it says ammonia. Ammonia. Well, it is a soluble form of nitrogen, but it's a gas. So if you've got ammonia in your soil, ammonia, guess where that ammonia is going? Off into the atmosphere. It's not sticking around at all. So we don't want to have ammonia in our soil at all. So why on your soil chemistry report are they telling you that uh, you got ammonia in your soil? The only way to produce ammonia is if you go anaerobic. So they're trying to tell you that your soil is anaerobic? Did you smell any of that ammonia when you collected it? Nope. So it's just it's one of those little oopses in the world of soil chemistry where they, I'm not sure that they really know what they're doing. So early successional plant species is really what that weed definition needs to be. It's not a plant out of place. Otherwise, all plants on the planet become weeds, and then what use is that definition? So weedy species, early succession, require disturbance. So now let's look at an example of how we deal with biology, how we deal with weeds using a biological approach, some real-world examples. So in this particular instance, we were working with Ian Moore in, in Tasmania, which is that island, you know, it's part of Australia, but it's a separate little continent. <coughs> South of Australia, Tasmania. We have cute little devils down there. Um, the Tasmanian government decided that they really wanted to look into this compost, compost tea business, because you now the chemical companies were saying, this woman's crazy, she doesn't know what she's talking about, she's got bad science, she doesn't do anything right. And then the other side saying, well, but we've been doing this for the last 25 years and, you know, explain it. If it's not true, then explain how we're doing this. So Ian Smith is an onion grower. And in this instance, he has been in conventional agriculture for the last, oh, probably 40 years. Ian is about um, 65 years old. And uh, so he's been in the business of growing onions. So he wants to try this approach because those inorganic fertilizers are getting darn expensive. Those pesticides, he's not making much money. Uh, he has a very large holding, so you're looking at something that's about 5,000 hectares, which is about 12,000, 12,500 12, 12, acres worth of land, all in onions. So he's taken two of his fields right next to each other. Each field is 150 acres. So going big time on this. So one stays in the conventional approach, and uh, so a uh, typical herbicide rate to knock back the uh, weeds. And the other didn't put any herbicide now, so he's talking about it's a reduced herbicide system because it's been in, he's been using herbicides for a long, long time on this field. So now this year, three applications of compost tea. Two were applied prior to seeding, so the weed, uh, the herbicide that he applied, two applications before putting the onions in. So instead of the herbicide on his um, biological field, um, he used the compost tea. And so now the picture that we're going to see is on the, well, which side is this? This is the chemical side. Look at the weeds in that onion field. Can you see the onions? Really? It's a little bit hard to find the onions, isn't it? Where are the onions? Well, you can start to see the rows of the onions. But look at those weeds. You know, if he doesn't do something about these weeds, he's going to lose that crop. Because those weeds are popping up out of the ground and they're going to shade those onions and, you know, it's all over. So he has to go back in here with the herbicides. But uh, how effective have these herbicides been in solving this problem? Not. Not at all. You might be able to knock down the uh, current set of weeds, but what's coming back? What's this weed seed thing in these kinds of fields? It's fairly impressive, isn't it? And the Roundup that he's using is not being effective at all. We have Roundup resistant weeds in this part of the world, so he's going to have to go out and use a more expensive herbicide in this next application. Whereas now let's look at the field that has had two applications of compost tea. There are no weeds to see. 
governance. You can see the onions and the onions are bigger than in the other fields. So we went out there and we dug up some of these onions because we wanted to look at how extensive the root system is. So we go back to the previous picture. This is where we were, we were digging up one of the onions, so we did a bunch of them. And I'll show you that data in just a minute. But, uh, you know, I just approved to you that it's not just this one picture from one part of the field that just didn't happen. You have any weeds. You know, it's the whole field. It's whole 150 acres. So he was really excited. Now, come the end of the year, he got much higher production levels of onions from this part of the, from this field as compared to the conventional. So here's one of those onions coming out of the conventional. So you can see all the weeds in this small little area. And he's digging out the onion. So this onion, you know, it's about that tall. Root system is only about four inches. And so looking down that root system going down into the soil, see these dark bands? That's disease. He's already got um, sclerotinia attacking the roots of the onions in these fields. And the onions were planted on exactly the same day in those fields. And here's on the biological side. That root system is down at about one and a half foot, almost two feet. And there is no disease on that root system to be found. So of course this is going to yield better for him. So really quite excited about it. Now, here's one little area in this field because he knew his neighbors would say, oh, you know, you, you didn't have any weed seeds in this field. Right. <laughs> so he did not put on compost seed on this one pass. So you can see what the weeds would have been had he not applied the compost seed. So that kind of looks like that other herbicide treated field, doesn't it? And look at what biology does to prevent the growth of weeds. So it means some herbicide, right? Reduced rate? He means reduced rate because he had previously been using herbicides. And so if you look at herbicide, amount of herbicide in the soil, there was herbicide in the soil left over from before because he's been putting herbicides on these systems for the last 40 years. That's what he means by that, the reduced herbicide. Question? Are you saying the compost is not metric Yes, because what does the biology do when you put bacteria and fungi into that soil? They're going to suck up that excess nitrate, pull it inside their bodies. Now it's held in a non nitrate form. Okay, so we just took all that wonderful nitrate in here that would have allowed weed seed production or uh, growth, and it's now inside of bacteria and fungi. How do you make that available back to your plant? Mm -hmm. Pay attention, you will be going there. So, uh, another example this is corn in uh, Michigan, so some work that we're doing with uh, Flower Field Incorporated. Uh, <coughs> corn is the crop in this system. They were asking the question of whether they had to use GMO corn or could they use a heritage corn. So they were trying to figure out uh, what do you do to grow heritage corn. They didn't like to sell it organically. Half this field has been treated with compost seed. And the other half has had roundup applications to it previous to this. So can you tell which side got the compost tea and which side got the roundup? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't show this to you if it was the other way around. <laughs> 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 so um, this is with the compost tea. And you know, this is the row of corn. And it just goes straight into the, and you almost, you can't even see the corn over where the weeds are. Because again, in Michigan, we have roundup ready weeds. Roundup doesn't touch most of our weeds anymore, so we have to go to a different herbicide. Way more expensive. So, you know, throw Roundup out the door, it's completely useless. But what, what do you replace it with? With the biology out there. Now, it's not completely weed-free, but as that corn pops up and starts to grow, it's connected into the mycorrhizal network in this soil. It's uh, got all that biology performing all the functions right around the root system, so this corn is taken off and it's doing very, very well. Whereas in the weed system, 
uh, yeah, the wheat is winning. So it's not just one kind of plant, it's not just one kind of um, agricultural system that we can use these, this knowledge in. It's anywhere you have wheat. Understand what is really allowing your weeds to take off and win, and make sure that we put the biology in that prevents that. So we'll be going through an understanding of that more and more and more. Any other questions? So I think we, you know, again, just the explanation of what we're talking about. If you're not tilling, um, would this uh, apply with a perennial orchard situation? Yep. So where we've got uh, weeds coming in under your perennials, so your trees or under shrubs like in blueberries, if you switch that biology in the soil to take out the excess nitrate, um, make certain that you have that shift of bacterial to fungal dominance, <coughs> we end up with no weeds underneath your um, shrubs, underneath your trees. Now, Mother Nature abhors bare soil. She's gonna put something in there. So why don't we choose what that plant is gonna be? Make it a secondary crop. You know, in, in this part of the world, why don't you put strawberries in there with your trees? Uh, brown nut, um, put in uh, a lot of the, the herbs, so basil, um, marjoram, uh, garlic, uh, well, garlic maybe not. Um, every once in a while, garlic will transfer its flavor to your overstored plant. And, you know, and garlic, garlic flavored avocado. I don't see any problem with it. <laughs> We uh, under these some of the grapevines up in upstate New York where we were on working with um, some grape growers for wine. Uh, we put mint underneath their Chardonnay vines. Yeah. And so they got mint flavored Chardonnay. And I really think this is a Christmas kind of wine. Yeah. <laughs> and they were just like, this is horrible, this is awful, we don't want mint in here. Okay, so we had to take the mint out. But hey, come on, we could have some really interesting flavors in some of the things that we were growing. Okay, they don't wanna, they're not thinking ahead. <laughs> Question? Do you want to just have like a flavor of peanut or something over there that have the legumes fixing that? A lot of the problem with the legumes is because they are connected to your overstory plant through mycorrhizal connections. And as that legume is fixing lots of nitrogen, it's giving that protein to your mycorrhizal fungus, and the mycorrhizal fungus transfers it to your overstory tree. And so your tree just keeps growing vegetatively, and you never get any fruit. So we've done that with uh, legumes. When, when you're thinking of your orchard system, and some of these interactions, here's our overstory tree, there's our you know, grapevine, whatever you're growing. Now typically, uh, in the conventional world, you would attempt to keep this soil bare. No plants growing in there because weeds are bad. Uh, any plants in this area would take water away from your tree. They'll take nutrition away from your tree. But if you understand the food web, you realize how ridiculous that is. Because there's a lot of work going on in um, Washington State where they're showing that the work that's always been referenced to say if um, you've got weeds, it takes water away from your plant. plant. Uh, in fact, uh, their choice of plants in that study were weedy species that are very um, water demanding. They transpire a lot of water through their leaves. Very thin leaf. They do suck water out of your soil. Okay, so not those plants. What happens when you come in and you put in um, some purslane below your overstory? <coughs> you reduce evaporation of water from your soil because purslane has big waxy leaves and it covers a great deal of the soil and so getting purslane, uh, uh, just a, a whole layer of purslane growing out here was great. Well, the purslane didn't grow everywhere. Okay, so let's put some dock out there. Pick the dock that doesn't grow very high. There are species of dock that don't get any taller than that, and even their seed um, doesn't get any taller than that. 
So again, uh, a mix of purslane and dock and all of the other understory plant species. So we really need people here in Hawaii going around looking at what could be some of these other plants. I'm pretty sure you've got dock in this state. I'm sure you got purslane. Let's go looking for the really short species and start selling these to people as um, don't ever have to mow again underneath your <coughs> trees uh, in this area. There is a website called um, Steppables. Yeah. And they have a whole list of these real short understory species. Well, a lot of them would be alien invaders in this part of the world. So you gotta pick and choose rather carefully. What we have going on at Rodale is a plot where we planted 25 of these different um, short growing. Um, they move out really rapidly, cover the soil. We're testing under the conditions of the environment in Pennsylvania, which is not going to work for here. But uh, we really need to have people here in Hawaii doing the same kind of trials. You know, every five foot square area, let's put one of these potentially useful plants and see how well it grows under your conditions. Well, and then you got the cuttings, you can collect the seed, and so next spring or this fall or whenever you harvest the seed, now you can be using those seeds to go out over a larger area. There was work done by Jay Fuhrer in North Dakota, and he has a YouTube presentation. It's about an hour and 45 minutes where he shows four different farms. So one's a dairy farm, one's a grazing pasture, another one is row crops, I forget what the third one is, the fourth one is, but four different farms where he has used this idea. And they talk about a cocktail of these short, low growing, um, highly competitive with weeds, weed competitors, so you just don't get weeds growing in there because weeds require disturbance, bare soil to really come in and establish. Uh, let's make sure they're mycorrhizal. The same kind of mycorrhizal fungi that um, your crop, whatever you want it to be. So these specific kinds of uh, problems, short, so you don't ever have to mow again. And isn't this what we should be doing in our lawns? I mean, this stuff, you gotta mow it all the time, what do you about? What a waste of your time and energy. So, and, you know, how many lawnmowers have you bought in your life? Um, so let's get these going in all these different environments, but an example of these four farms. And what Jay showed was, in the first year, it was um, three or four of the species of seed that he put into the cocktail. And the cocktail contained, I think it was uh, somewhere between 15 and 25 species of plants, all with these characteristics. Well, which ones are gonna grow this year? So he found out in that first year, three to four of the species grew, good coverage on the surface of the soil, winter comes along, takes them out. Next year, it's a different set a three to four species came up. Almost nothing that grew in the first year grew in the second year. So see, if you don't put those three or four species of seeds in, you have been in bad condition come year number two because the weather was really different in year number two. So in this part of the world where you, you need to some, something to establish now, but then come you harvest your plant and in three months you want to have that really good understory coverage so you better have a different set of species of, of seeds you've got in there so you maintain coverage. In the third year it was yet a different set of species. In the fourth year it was something else. When I talked to him after year five he was like well you know we've really not seen any of these things that came up in the first year not they haven't come back. Is the seed there? Is it just waiting for the right conditions? Oh yeah. Because as he's gone through about 15 years of doing this trial, 
So now I see some of those original plants, but they're always in different mixtures. They're never the same. So these growers have been extremely happy with the, with the results. Good question. Mm -hmm. So these um, species in this cocktail resemble weeds in a lot of ways because they're competing for the same environment. Are they different because of the mycorrhizal association? Are they different because they require a lower nitrate level to germinate? And so we're always wanting to choose those things. How do you know when you're getting these pulses of nitrate and they're not? So if we're, select, if we're getting the growth of something like a dock or a purslane, some of the weedy species, then you suspect that nutrient cycling in your soil is still a little bit off. But at least we got soil coverage while we're converting to a healthier, better balanced set of organisms in the soil. That transition period can be a real problem. Yeah. Where you're trying to go from here to there, and something in your soil is keeps wiping out your fungi, keeps knocking your fungi down, keeps knocking your protozoa down. Well, help things go in the right direction by making sure your soil is always covered with something that's going to be at least feeding somebody in the soil, yeah. putting foods into that system, and hopefully we'll build that up pretty rapidly. I'd much rather have first land than that than this one. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, because, you know, personally, you gotta, they don't have to mold the real short ones, but in that sense, you know, what? Hey, what does a uh, purslane do? Purslane. What, what does it do to the soil purslane? Um, the, the species that we, we see that are the real short ones tend to have a the bacterial biomass ratio of about 0.7. So if you're trying to grow vegetables, if you're trying to grow even some of your row crops, that first lane is going to be pretty beneficial. So we'll go through that ratio for the whole successional system after I show you a little more data. Must top data. But first lane, it, it is edible. A lot of people put it in their salads. So some of these alternate crops, we need to convince people that first lane is part of a salad. Mm -hmm. Dandelion should be part of a salad. Nasturtium, part of your salad. Yeah, so we've got some education here. What about nasturtiums? Uh, or would they make an onion? See, because nasturtiums often vine, and they'll wind it. So it's fine if you've got a tree or something, but when you're dealing with corn or wheat or barley, not a good idea. So it depends on what your overstory plant is, what you want to make. Nasturtiums are um, down there around about a 0.6 to 0.7 ratio of fungi to bacteria, so for vegetables, that'd be fine. Um, probably not so good for trees or perennial plants. So we'll go through more on that. Well, we had this guy from the middle of that from Thailand for a while. He ate a lot of weeds. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just went out there for wherever. And he thinks that, you know, a lot of people think that's healthy. Are you saying it's not? I'm saying probably it's yeah. probably it's diversity of food resources. It's another diversity there. <laughs> yeah, so you gotta get used to some flavors. It's yeah. you know I've never quite convinced myself to put that nasturtium in my mouth. Nah, quite. Do. So the bitter isn't necessarily nice, but in other plants, you know. So let's define very carefully what we mean by bitter. Mm -hmm. so, and that's where these flavors get to be a difficult thing to deal with. So when you're dealing with lettuce, like iceberg or um, some of the shards, things like that, you get that real bitter flavor, that is nitrate. Okay. But you know, it's like when you um, eat um, kale or sometimes with the, I'm just facing the name. It has a rocky, it has a real, yeah, it's peppery. peppery. So that's not really bitter, that's pepper, and that's, you know, so here you go, nutritional guys, help me. <laughs> I don't know everything. Well, it seems like as the plants get older, they get more bitter too, so is that the? It depends on whether it's a nitrate bitter or it's just because you've got some of the more complex um, materials that are being put down in those leaves. So here we go in trying to define taste, trying to define flavor. Very difficult to do. I bet if, uh, if I put the same uh, mango in front of all of you, some of you would say, oh, no, this is so delicious. And others would go, mm -hmm. And others of you would go, I don't like that flavor at all. So 
Labor is a hard thing with one kind. This is some work we were doing with uh, people in uh, key lime plowing. In the world of permaculture, they encourage people to key lime plow to break up the compaction down at about four feet into the soil. And I look at a key lime plow where the idea is that you're going to be plowing along the contour. So if you have a hillside, you, with a key lime plow, you're going to till so that as water moves down your hill, it's caught in the um, furrows that you've put in, and you move that water sideways along the hill instead of having it just run down. So that's the permaculture reasoning behind the key lime plowing. But we also know that we've got compaction down into that soil, especially when you're dealing with something that's coming out of conventional agriculture. We have a lot of compaction in those soils. So what we've been doing with these guys is along the tines, where you have the big metal shank going down into the soil with a little wing, where that is what's shattering your soil as it moves through it about four feet. Along that shank, we're putting a PVC pipe with little holes in it, so the compost tea is being released out into the soil all along that four foot depth of your soil. And a big um, spout down right at the bottom, so we're getting all of that lower level just uh, totally wetted up with that compost tea. So we're delivering the biology all the way down. And so we were testing this, and you're looking at the differences between the conventional system and where they did one application of compost tea using a key line cloud. And look at how much moisture is retained in that soil as compared to the conventional system that wasn't key line. When you look at tons of hay being produced, and that is a significant improvement just because you're delivering that biology into the soil, you're opening up the structure, even in grapes, uh, increasing grape production from six to seven and a half tons is huge in the world of table grapes. Question. I still don't understand exactly what's going on. They have, can you describe the system that they're using in a little more detail? It's like a floor going four feet down. The, uh, you know what a plow? You know, yeah. so this is basically plow. like a plow, only the idea with it is, is you put it down into the soil, so your soil surface. The shanks are going down into the ground and you have a, a wing on the bottom. So as this is pulled through the soil, so you're leaving a furrow behind through the soil, but you're shattering the soil instead of instead of like a disc plow. You're taking the stuff at the bottom and you're mixing it all up with a disc plow or a chisel plow where you're disturbing the soil and, and uh, slicing and dicing and crushing it. This is just a sideward, sideward motion, and so it's gonna shatter the soil along the lines of the pens, the larger chunk um, portions of the soil. Mm -hmm. um, the shank is usually only, you know, it's a metal shank that goes down, so it's what, about um, four inches, maybe five inches across, goes down into the ground, and the wings go out just a little ways. So that it moves sideways and shatters the soil in between. So the distance between each one of the shanks is probably about four feet. So you'll you'll be pulling that through. Well, just shattering the soil often doesn't do a lot of good because the next time it rains, it all just recompacts and uh, you wasted your time and money. Same thing when we're doing, dealing with a mold or plow. Everyone know what a mold board plow is? No. Okay. Mold board typically goes down into the soil um, four to six inches, and it's going to take your soil at four to six inches, flip it up. So what was at four to six inches is now on the surface of the soil. What was on the surface of your soil is now down at four inches. Simple mold board plow. So you can see this whole um, portion of your soil is undisturbed. That got flipped, but this, it's all intact in there. So you're only slicing and dicing your fungi that are at the interfaces of what you flip over. All the worms in there, all the microarthropods, think about yourself being a worm in that soil, and you all of a sudden go upside down. What happened? You know, so you 
flail around and, and now you start going again. You don't get sliced and diced. Um, these are going down four feet. So you have a you know a slice through your soil, but this is moving sideways. So you're breaking up the soil. Chisel plow typically goes down about 12 inches, and it does a pretty good job of mixing all of this. A disc plow typically goes down about 18 inches, and it does a fairly frightening job of mixing all that soil. Rototill. How far down does your rototill go? Four inches. Depends. Yeah, on what you set it. So rototill, maybe four inches, six inches. I've seen them 12 inches down. And you are wearing blending your soil with a rototiller. So when somebody says they're plowing, yeah, there's a few more questions that you need to be asking about exactly how are they plowing, how are they tilling. Where's the compaction going to be imposed on your soil when you mow more plow? It's at four to six inches because that blade is slicing down there, but of course your blade doesn't just slice, it's pressing down on the soil. In order to do so, you're compacting anything that's right there at four to six inches. Flipping this over, but you can pose compaction throughout your field. When you do a chisel plow, there, where's your compaction going to form? 12 inches. When you do a disc plow, where's your compaction going to form? How far down are your blades going? So even with the permaculture approach, where they're running through here with a key line, where's your compaction going to be forming? So I don't care how you plow, how you till, you are imposing compaction on that soil. And you are going to have to put the biology back into that system to build that structure. To reform the aggregates, the macro aggregates, the air spaces, the hallways, the windows, the doors, for water and oxygen to move down into that soil. And so when we're looking at the effect of adding the biology <coughs> back into the system to do this job, see how important that is in terms of yields, in terms of holding moisture in your soil. We need to put the biology back into the system. So just doing some statistics here where we're looking at increase in moisture and then increase in organic matter. That's with one tillage event. And that tillage can be helping increase that organic matter because the biology is put back into the system is really important. How much of our CO2 in our atmosphere could we put back into the soil and sequester if we're increasing the organic matter content by almost a full percentage point by one tillage? Look at our till. Is this the best way to do it? So those are some of the things that we need to be asking about. This is some work that we were doing in South Africa. We worked with ZZ2. Um, for uh, quite a few years, uh, got them making compost, got them to understand compost tea, making uh, okay compost tea. So when they came to us, they could be in tomato production for one to two years. And then they would have to stop producing tomatoes in that soil because the diseases, the mildew, the blight, um, the rutini nematodes would be so bad that they would not be able to make a crop of tomatoes. So had to be out of tomatoes for up to 10 years, some of their, some of their fields, um, they would not be able to go back in and get a crop of tomatoes before 14 years. So Tommy Van Zyl uh, was his grandfather who started the company. His grandfather went out and bought one farm, put in tomatoes. It was great, they got good production for the first two to three years of tomatoes and then disease started taking them out. So, he had the money from the first couple of years of tomato production, so he went and bought another farm. And put tomatoes in there and then he let that first farm go fallow. So, two, three years later, he went back in and he put tomatoes over here and he got one to two years worth of tomato growth before the diseases wiped him out and then he had to go back fallow. But the second time this went fallow, and of course, when the tomatoes here die, what does he go do? Buys another farm. Is this slash and burn agriculture? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and these, the first two farms, sooner or later, could come back into tomato production, but because when that first, that third farm 
farmer wipes out, he goes and buys another farmer. So he's constantly buying more property. But that first farm, two to three years before you could put tomatoes back in. Then the next time around, it was five to six years before you could put tomatoes back in and you could actually make a crop of tomatoes. Grow for one to two years and then disease wiped them out. So then it was eight to nine years and then it was 10 to 12 years. And so some of their farms, they can't go back into tomatoes for 14 years. By the time we're working, we started working with ZZ2. They own 300,000 hectares of the province of Limpopo in South Africa because they had to keep expanding the amount of tomato land that they um, had to grow in so that they would be able to get at least 5,000 hectares of tomatoes. So there's their turning point. They have to be making growing tomatoes on 5,000 hectares in order to keep the, the company alive and pay all the salaries, yada, yada, yada. They would only get 18% first quality, that is tomatoes that you can sell whole. They have no blemishes that people would buy them if you put them on the shelf. Their shelf life was only about 10 days, which means they really could not ship these tomatoes to Europe because by the time you ship them to Europe and they get to Europe and they get put out on the shelves, they would be starting to rot. So they had to stay at local, with local markets so they could sell. They were only in 80 tons per hectare of yield. Came to us, how do you make compost? We started working with them on making their compost. And I'll show you some of the fun things we learned from them as uh, we went along. Um, we started putting that compost out, so because their soils were so bad and the compost really wasn't all that wonderful, uh, they were putting out 10 tons of compost per hectare. Per hectare, which is about two and a half tons of compost per acre. So uh, after implementation, implementation, so in year one, some of their worst lands, um, they were up down to just three years before they could go back into tomatoes. They have now dropped this. They do continuous tomato production. They don't ever go out of tomatoes. As long as you're putting the biology back into the system and they use the compost to put that biology back into the system, they never rotate out of tomatoes. This is natural agriculture. Um, in their best systems, continuous tomatoes, right off the bat. 50% uh, of their harvest is now first quality, and it has a shelf life of about three weeks. They are selling into Europe. Um, and currently, we have increased in the very first year of tomato production, we increased yields um, up to 100 tons per hectare. So they were really happy with um, going biological and they could very well see um, making the compost and spending the money to have a composting team. So on their property, what do they do with all their land? Because they really only need 5,000 hectares of tomatoes and you know that's uh, their first 10 farms, they got it. So what do they do with the other, uh, let's see, they have a total of 34 farms. That's where we started working with them. So what do they do on the other land? So now they're growing avocados, they're growing onions, they're growing grapevines, they're growing um, other fruits, so apples and peaches and pears and, and all. They diversify. <laughs> so when Tommy comes back to me after the first year, he said, you have saved us $40 million. Saved them. Now that's taken out the cost of the equipment to do the composting. We saved them $40 million. So, of course, what did I say? Yeah. <laughs> and he did exactly what you guys just did. He laughed at me. <laughs> you have to remember to make this agreement before. Yeah. Now, that when they're desperate, okay, we get you know 10% of your increase in yield. You know, 10% of $40 million would have been, I am so, such a stupid business person. <laughs> So, fun stuff. Questions about this one? Um, when you're talking about setting up a composting system, are, are you talking about with machines and properly composting, like green, all kinds of green waste, or are you talking about specifically uh, crops? Where, where are you getting your materials from for your compost? Yes, all of the above. Because in a system like this, uh, they are all the waste tomatoes that they have, where they, they were putting it into a big hole in the ground. 
too. So when you think about these guys, the tons of tomatoes that they produce and sell, um, and all of the stuff that was no good, that was so bad that you couldn't even put it into tomato paste or tomato sauce or you know, chopped up canned tomatoes. So thousands of tons of tomatoes on a monthly basis just going into a big hole in the ground. Can you imagine what the fly problem is like? Ooh. Would you like to live downwind from a big hole that was happily filling up with that was disgusting. Um, there are a few people I'd like to push into that hole. <laughs> yes, there is a vengeful bone in my body. No. Um, so and so we stopped. So instead of putting stuff into that hole, that all that waste tomato material now goes into the composting operation. And other things. Yeah, and they have alien invader trees, nitrogen fixing, leguminous trees from brought over from Australia that are, is just decimating their native forests. So they offer the service to anybody in Limpopo where they can come in and they will take down those leguminous trees, they chip them up, there's their nitrogen for their compost piles. So they're providing this immense service and they're getting a lot of benefit out of it. They grow fields of alfalfa for the express purpose of using that alfalfa to put into the compost pile. So yeah, there's, when you sit down and you start looking at all of the sources of organic matter around you, it's incredible the amount of waste material that can go into that pile. At Rodeo, we're working on food waste. And uh, because of the way the haulers are not doing any effort to keep out the plastics and the garbage, and, you know, it's like the other day we found a baby carriage in the compost pile. <laughs> and why, why do people think it? <laughs> now little plastic toys, we have a whole Star Wars collection yeah. from the compost, from the food waste. <laughs> <laughs> I got one too. <laughs> it was just, you know, the other day we found one of those uh, whole, you know, the attachments you put on the end of the hose uh -huh. to spray stuff with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to do a bit, of, and that's what we're about to do with Rodale, let's come out with a report on that. You have to insist that these things are all taken out of your compost, out of your waste material before it comes on farm, or you just turn in all of this into toxic stuff. Now these guys, when the waste comes into the system from a food waste operation or from the city where you're collecting uh, leaf material, leaf litter material, or green waste from the city, you gotta send it through a magnet. You gotta pull out all of that stuff, and typically you have to sieve it as well, or you just end up with putting the most horrific stuff into your agricultural fields. So when we're dealing with the general public contributing to this, there's some additional steps we have to take. That tipping fee needs to actually um, be used for something. Do they have to um, test the soil and reapply the compost tea after each harvest? They, um, yeah, they, they typically are still putting compost out. They've gone, and, and part of what you have to realize with this system is the way they put their compost on. They laser level their fuel. So, you know, the old, everything's absolutely smooth. Uh, and then they go out and they ridge till up. Um, a bit, so they're taking the soil out of either side and they're piling it up here. And then they go, then the back of that machine, they drop that 10 pounds of compost right down the middle of that bed. And then behind <coughs> them, a couple more ridge tillers to put a layer about yay thick over the compost. And then they go put in their scaffolding for the tomatoes, and then they plant their tomatoes down that line. So every bed has two rows of tomatoes. On it. So that's how they're concentrating their compost. When they first started, they were putting 10 tons of compost per hectare. Now they're only putting one ton of compost per hectare. Because as time has passed, they've improved the biology, and even though they ridge till, they just need that little bit of an inoculum going back into the system. So one ton per hectare is about um, a little bit like 0.3. Um, tons per acre. And that will continue to follow the need for it, so eventually would it be possible to not have to do it? Yeah, I think so. When, now, if they could put it in some understory plants, so here's one of those things that I'm like, come on, guys, we'll try this, try this, try this, and they're like, oh, we can't do it, we can't do it. Yes, you can. Too much work. 
I'll get them there. So, <laughs> yeah. And they still put out compost teams because they are still dealing with neighbors that are spraying pesticides and you can see the effect of the drift of those pesticides into their tomato fields. And so when their neighbors spray, they've asked their neighbors to be informed when they are going to spray so that they can then the next day get out there and put on an application of a crop of biology on the foliage. Because otherwise they tend to get blight or you know, something in it. By the time you see blight on your tomatoes, ah, ah, you're going to have to work awfully hard to deal with that. Whereas if you know that you just wiped out all your biology because they sprayed, you can go out the next day and resuscitate the system so you don't have any blight or mildew or anything. Are they, are they organic? Yeah. They, um, they, do not, they are not certified organic because they don't see any need. They can already sell their tomatoes for more than enough money um, to go through the certification process. So the first three years I worked with them, they were trying to go organic. And so they had sections of the farm that were organic, and they finally just went, Bert, yeah, that's paperwork crap. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work. Right. You know. So do they have a label of like no spray, or is it something that they can Yeah, natural. I think they have like a yeah. natural agriculture on, the, on their label. But you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's word of mouth that builds reputation. Yeah. But you go to South Africa and you ask somebody about what kind of tomato did you, is this? It's a ZZ2 tomato. And everybody recognizes pretty much throughout the country that a ZZ2 tomato is got the best flavor. So they don't care it's organic, they don't care it's natural, they don't care they're after flavor. Now can we educate the public so that they recognize that uh, they should be after nutrition? And how do you find out about nutrition? Uh, in the works. How do we do this? Can we take a 10 minutes? Please. Thank you. Good.